seven o'clock, the uh, Bridgewater Zoning Board of Appeals starting here. Um, just to do a quick introduction that uh, <coughs> due to Governor Baker's uh, May 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting uh, laws under chapter 30A section 18 and the governor's um, May, March 15th order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may be gathered in one place. This meeting of the uh, Bridgewater Zoning B Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation uh, to the greatest extent possible. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be granted, but uh, every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. This meeting is being recorded and within 48 hours will be posted on a link of the uh, records of the town's website and or other town social media. Uh, the following members of the Bridgewater Zoning Board of Appeals are participating remotely. Myself, Brian Heath, Chairman, Jerry Chipman, Vice Chairman, Anna Klinas, member. <coughs> and uh, during the meeting, all votes of the board will be taken as roll call votes. The following Bridgewater town staff will also participate uh, remotely. Uh, Jennifer Burke, the uh, Community and Economic Development Director. Steve Solari here, our uh, Bridgewater Building Commissioner. Uh, Jasmine Far. Farinacci, Farinacci? <laughs> exact, sorry, Jess. So uh, at this time, uh, everyone's mic is muted. Uh, the board's mics will be unmuted throughout the whole meeting. Um, and as items appear on the agenda, the project representative's mic will be unmuted as well. If the project is a pub, uh, excuse me, if the project is a public hearing and allows for public comment, uh, we ask you to use the chat feature at the bottom of the of your screen and to ask questions by listing your name and address and your question. Uh, the chair will recognize all questions in order. You can also use <coughs> the raised hand feature in the uh, participation men menu and you'll be unmuted uh, when the chair recognizes you. Again, please state your name and address before asking your question. If you're on the phone, you can uh, dial nine to raise your hand. So with that said, we're going to start the meeting. Um, we have, uh, again, we have the one meeting. It's a continuance of our March 22nd meeting uh, related to 13 Vernon Street request for a special permit. So at the last, uh, last meeting that we had, which was a while ago, we were, uh, the board was discussing with the applicant, the, the application of section 5.30 to this case before us. Um, at the time it was the applicant's uh, attorney's position that that was not applicable. Several members of the board, myself included, believed that it was. We had um, requested outside independent counsel to review the matter. And um, as the town's counsel was, had a, an issue with um, independence on this, we found a uh, counsel Delaney over in Plymouth. Uh, he pro provided a, a memo to the board uh, strictly looking at some of the issues that we had raised, whether uh, under this section 5.30 was applicable, um, and if it was, how would that impact this? If it wasn't applicable, how, how it might impact this? The uh, memo basically went through, and, and it was the interpretation of uh, Mr. Attorney Delaney that section 5.30 of the bylaws did apply. And that under that bylaw, the, uh, the building on the site had been abandoned and as such lost its protections under, the, uh, under section five of the bylaws for um, non-conforming uses and structures. Um, I'm just, hold, just trying to summarize here, building. Uh, he went through um, some analysis as to 
well, if if it had not applied, what what we would have been ruling on, and um, basically it gets into well, yes, this was a non-conforming. It, if if it had not applied, you could have rebuilt, and you, if at that time you could have rebuilt somewhere else as long as it didn't create greater non-conformance. Um, but at the end, the summary of, of his opinion was that 5.3 did apply. Um, he did say that, hey, look, it's, it's, a, it's a law. People interpret laws differently. It was his interpretation that it did. And that as such, the, um, the building itself lost its protection. And if any development or use of the land was going to happen after that, it would have to be in full compliance with the existing bylaws of, of Bridgewater. In addition to that, we received, well, excuse, subsequent to that, we received a letter from um, the applicant's attorney, Ed Brennan, <coughs> um, basically stating that, that he had the opportunity to review attorney Delaney's letter and it's understanding he in this and, uh, and I'll read is I'll read this one it's not as long as the other one <clears throat> I've had the opportunity to review attorney Delaney's letter dated April 17 2020 my understanding is as follows attorney Delaney has concluded that section 5.4 is inapplicable due to the nature of the damage to the building section 5.30 is applicable development of the premises premises must comply <clears throat> with the current provisions of the bylaws and that such development may take place elsewhere on the premises as of right so long as the zoning nonconformities do not in, in, are, are not increased. Uh, Mr. Bugajin, uh, the proponent, sorry, sorry for that one, <laughs> proposed uh, development does in fact comply with the current provisions of the bylaws. The proposed house is in accordance, is in accord with all applicable setback and lot uh, area requirements. The lot has 15 feet of frontage. Building inspector Steve Slowry has previously concluded that the lot is pre-existing non-conforming as to frontage and there are no other zoning uh, non-conformities proposed by the applicant in respect I respectfully request that the board adopt Attorney Delaney's conclusion as set forth in the summary of the letter. Con uh, conclude that no zoning relief is required in the building inspector salary to issue a building permit to the applicant to include the raising of the existing building upon the applicant's application for the same and building inspector salary's determination that the application is otherwise in order. Please uh, allow me to extend my thanks to Attorney Delaney and the board respective time and attention to this matter. So basically that's, that's where, where we are with that, um, right? I would say that I don't believe that that's a true interpretation of Attorney Delaney's letter or his conclusions. Um, in regards to uh, the 15 foot right away being a pre-existing approved grandfathered condition to the law. Um, under, under section 35.30, the property in question ha has been abandoned for more than 36 months. I, I don't, I'm gonna be honest, I don't remember how long it's been abandoned. I believe uh, at the time it was more than 10 years. Um, so pursuant to the, to the bylaws, the applicant loses protection otherwise afforded uh, to such non-conforming structure. Further, under 5.30, the non-conforming uses of the land or the building is lost. The owner can only use or develop the land in accordance with the terms of the Bridgewater zoning bylaws. That means as, as attorney Delaney and his thing and follow-up confirmed, no, that means you've guessed, you've got a lot, you've got 15 foot of frontage, but in order to build something on that, you've got to comply with all the zoning bylaws. You're in a residential AB district, which requires a minimum of 150 foot of frontage. You have 15, you don't have that. The other option that, that we talked about at one point and looked at was, okay, well, what if you make it a retreat law? Well, under the retreat law, under section 8.12, 
you're required to have a minimum of 30 foot width in regards to the parcel at all at all points. Again, you're down to 15, so you don't meet that as as well. So my interpretation of the bylaws, I think, and as I confirmed with Attorney Delaney's is, is basically as I stated it. The building itself lost its non-conforming protection. You have to build in accordance with all the bylaws. And right now that lot does not meet the bylaws. It does not have the frontage and as such would require a variance. You would have to get a variance under either the, the retreat lot or the regular building requirements under uh, for a single family under residential AB zoning. I will open it up to any of the other members first and then we can hear from the applicant. I'd actually like to hear from uh, attorney Brennan where he had submitted a letter. Um, perhaps he wants to expound on that. Oh, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chipman. Uh, I'm reading uh, Attorney Delaney's opinion uh, as such that if we are disqualified on the 5.3 as a result of the abandonment, that we have lost the right to rebuild the house at its current location with the, cur at, with the current zoning violations, meaning the setback from the boring, uh, boring vegetated wetland. <coughs> we cannot, we have lost the right to rebuild where it is. Uh, but you may recall our proposal was to move this house out of that area. We, we don't have to build there. We can move it elsewhere on the 26 acres and fully comply with all the other elements of your zoning bylaw, but for the frontage. But I, I stand by my position that it's a pre-existing non-conforming lot. That disqualification mm -hmm. under 5.3 means that we cannot rebuild a house at that location within the 20 or 19 and 22 feet uh, setbacks from the, from the wetlands. That we cannot do that. But I don't agree that the, the lot itself, which has been in existence since prior to the adoption of zoning, the lot as configured, I believe, has uh, maintained uh, its perimeter since 1919. Uh, so we predate the zoning, and I suggest that it's pre-existing non-conforming lot. However, if you determine uh, and agree with Attorney Delaney that 5.30, we have lost the non-conforming status of that structure by virtue of uh, abandonment, then we cannot rebuild where it is. Uh, and we all we submitted on the 5.4, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, I'd just like to touch on that for a moment because that talks about what, uh, and Attorney Delaney talked a bit about what destruction of a, of a building might be. Uh, however, he completely uh, ignored in 5.4 the word otherwise. Uh, he, he focused more on some type of disaster that would have resulted in destruction of the building up to 80%. Uh, but they are, the word otherwise there, I think, would give this board the latitude to determine that the deterioration of the building over time uh, would, would still qualify this under 5.4 and allow the building to be rebuilt. However, you may recall that rebuilt, the definition in your ordinance or your bylaw, uh, provides for moving a structure. I think we had some discussion on that at the last meeting. So uh, I think even if we're disqualified under 5.3, we maintain the status as a pre existing non conforming lot. However, any structure built on that lot would have to comply with all of the elements of your zoning, but I maintain, but for the frontage. Uh, and the same, my position is the same on 5.40. Uh, if the board determined that it, uh, uh, that it, it can deteriorate over time, uh, which would fit under otherwise, you can't ignore that word in his analysis of the zoning bylaw construction. And that being the case, the board would have the discretion to allow us to move that house to another place on the lot and complying with the area and setbacks. 
and we, we can do that and we propose that we ask the board to allow us to do that. Well, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. I um, respectfully disagree with it. Uh, I don't agree with the fact that, that 5.4, the otherwise is there. 5.4 is strictly, and, and if you look at everything else, it's, it's basically talking about a building uh, destroyed or damaged. And then it lists, you know, all those sort of acts of God or things that don't normally occur. 5.3 deals with a building that has basically been abandoned. So to get around five, to get away from 5.3 by saying that, well, because we didn't use and nobody, nobody uh, was in the building and utilized it, it, it kind of fell into disrepair and it's destroyed. I, I don't agree with that interpretation. And I don't believe that uh, attorney Delaney even, uh, you know, and if I under, misunderstood you, apologize, but I don't, I didn't get that from his memo, that, that that's what he was saying, if that's what you were inferring. I, I don't think he analyzed the word otherwise. Whereas in 5.3 focused on the de word development in his analysis of 5.3. So if I could direct you, Attorney Brennan, to page five of his letter, he does address or otherwise. And I would agree with his interpretation. And in, uh, on page five, he uh, agrees that he does not agree, I'm sorry, that section 5.4 is applicable because it's referring to destruction by damage by hazards, not deterioration by neglect, which is what we have here essentially. Um, and then he describes what the, or otherwise refers to, and he gives them examples of as an earthquake or a gas explosion. Those, those facts are not in play here. And really what we have is a hazard by neglect or failure to maintain. Actually, could fit on the otherwise. I mean, otherwise, it gives the board the discretion to to adopt that if the board is inclined to do that. Uh, I, I read five point four, sort of as Anna kind of said there. It's it's really, you know, something that's destroyed the building. You know, some cause. You know, not neglect or non-use. That's that to me. That wasn't the premise of five point. Uh, four zero. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, with regard to that, um, actually, he, the attorney actually, Delaney actually decided what he thought otherwise meant. But otherwise really was not really defined at all. But I will say this about the building. Part of the destruction of that building was because it was flooded. Because that was part of the problem with the Sturdivant Pond and the fact that water was backing up from Stuart and Bond, that it easily flooded during storm events. And it became uh, a problem. That's why it's very close to wetlands. It's actually within an area that was getting inundated on a regular basis. It became, and actually it started to affect even the access to the lot itself. And that's why the access has to be rebuilt is because from flooding events, there was damage to the structure and to the access uh, and that's and that's part of the reason why it was not used um, after a certain date. And, and the other thing I did want to point out was if we go back to um, uh, Mr. Solari's uh, initial uh, letter, um, his determination in the very beginning was that it was a legal residential lot. Uh, and and that, um, I don't think that that status changes. I don't think that the, the amount of frontage that it has, uh, whether it has 15, it has 10, or it has 180, I don't think that that changes the status of the lot as being um, usable as a residential lot, as long as the structure that you put on there meets the front, side, and rear setbacks uh, that are of that district. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may. The, uh, if you look at uh, on Attorney Delaney's letter's last page on his summary, uh, he talk, his last paragraph is, and it, it follows up after the discussion on 5.3, uh, which kind of ties into what I was saying before, that we cannot build rebuild that structure where it is, uh, because that structure has lost its, uh, its status as pre-existing non-conforming. However, if you deem that that is the case and we cannot rebuild there, uh, it, it, his conclusion flows, as I was saying, that 
a new structure may be, a new dwelling may be reconstructed as of right at a different location on a premises uh, that does not result in an increase in existing nonconformities, which would include the frontage. So we're not increasing the nonconformities with the frontage. And when we relocate the house, we're not increasing the nonconformities with the setback from the wetlands. So it does say existing nonconformities. So, and I, I look at that as, as being consistent with uh, your building inspector's determination to pre existing nonconforming lot. He's saying we can relocate it on the premises, but we cannot increase existing nonconformities, which, which we will not do. I, I would agree with you, Attorney Brennan, if that's what his letter said. And if you go to page four, he goes into the whole thing. That conclusion, which you just stated, which I agree with, applies if 5.30 did not. And we've had those cases before the board previously. And as he stated, you know, if you had a non-conforming building that was, had no issue with 5.30, as far as losing its protection due to abandonment, yes, I, I would agree with you 100% that, you know, we've had these before. If you wanted to change that building and that change was not increasing the nonconformity of the building, then it's not even a Zoning Board of Appeals issue. So to that, I would agree with you, but that's not the case here. And that's not what the attorney's letter went into. He basically said, if, 5.30 did not apply, that's the scenario you would have. And it's, it's, it's at least mine conclusion along with, you know, and, and sort of bolstered by Delaney, Ms., uh, Attorney Delaney's uh, memo and his instructions here that, that 5.3 does apply. Uh, I'm not in agreement with you that that this is a pre-existing buildable lot grandfathered in with 15 foot frontage. Um, I, I don't believe, and Steve's here, uh, you know, although, you know, he, I don't remember, and it's been a while since I read his letter. Um, I, can, I can just go drive on a little bit of this he said. I never said in my letter that the building could be moved. I said the opposite. The building had to be built in the same location. I never said anything about the building being moved to a different location in my letter. That's correct. I, I don't it know was, where that came from. I well, don't the, know where the, that the, the, no, no. letter. Was you just parts. said it. You, you just said it. So I was curious where it came from. No, I said there were two parts of your letter. And right. the first no, no, I was saying you, Larry. The attorney just said that I said it could be moved to a different location. I never said that. No, the only, the only thing I was looking at in your letter, Mr. Slarry, is the uh, part that says the, uh, uh, is my determination that 1300 Vernon is a legal non-conforming grandfathered lot with residential structure. But I did say, not unrelated to your letter, that rebuilding under the definition in the zoning ball allows for movement. Okay. That, that, that's what... I do believe that, but I don't, your letter doesn't say anything about moving the building. Do we have any, um, any additional from any of the other members questions or concerns? Uh, uh, Mr. Slara, I just wanted to get back to you. Do, do, do you agree that it's pre-existing non-conforming lot or as set out in the nope. December 4th letter? My interpretation on reading the bylaw and how I came with my decision is based on my interpretation, which was left open because I needed to get a, a special permit to determine the exact, if, if a building inspector cannot come up with a, a something that is, is legally reasonable, there's gotta be some sort of a determination by somebody. And usually the, your next best thing is to send it to the ZBA for a special permit and then get legal advice, go through the process to make the right determination. That's what I tried to do. But your, but your letter didn't ask for advice. Your letter made a statement about your position. I shouldn't, I shouldn't use the word advice. I, I saw about that. But I sent it for what, to me, it was a special permit needed by the Zona Board of Appeals. Right. 
Okay. May I say something? Yes. Yep. So, Mr. Bajingi. Yes. So. You're just going to say your name. That's all. My name's Manny Bajinga, the owner of the parcel. So, I don't know if Mr. Slary the holds any weight to it's a non-conforming buildable lot. I, I'm, I'm not. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know the answer of everything. If it is non-conforming, and we can build a house. I can assure you that Larry and, and us, we will put the house in a location that it meets every standard of the law, the bylaw for Bridgewater, but also the huge improvements that I'm paying for basically to get this water under control that floods out the neighbors and adjacent neighbors and floods out the ponds that's making a very big improvement on the waterways with the flooding that they've had through. If you remember that the neighbors complained about flooding, the neighbors complained about waters coming in through their backyards, that problem would 95% go away and Larry could correct me if I'm wrong. So if we had, I'm just saying, if we had a non-conforming, um, a lot that was grandfathered in, I'm only better in the neighborhood and I'm not trying to build, like I've stated, a development. I'm trying to build a retreat lot for myself or a lot so that I can have my kids and, and my wife there. But it's, it's not, I just wish that the board would understand and the neighbors would understand as well is it's not a lot for me to uh, develop. It's a lot for me, for myself. I, I want to have privacy just like the neighbors, but I'm putting the money into curing a lot of problems that has been dumped into that brook and making a 24 foot travel way as Mr. Uh, Chipman uh, brought forward at the last meeting. It's a huge improvement to the town of Bridgewater making this. It's not that I'm just bettering myself. I'm also trying to help. I'm not trying to help. This is what I need to do to make everything right and make sure that my house doesn't get flooded. My land doesn't get flooded as well. So I would just, if it's a non-conforming grandfathered lot, I don't know if it is or if it's not, but if it is, I would just ask that, you know, it's not just a one-way street that I'm trying to take for myself. I'm trying to make it much better uh, with improvements as well. The public betterment for him, he, I'm talking about a 24 foot wide uh, coat, the past water, where right uh, now it, it hung up there, floods. And by him put, putting this driveway in with this significant investment in a driveway opening with a culvert that size, that's going to now alleviate water being backed up and not being able to get through that area. Um, it's in the public benefit for him to be able to do this and be able to put one home back there. We're talking 28 acres, one home. It had 15 foot was the access that was there since 1919. I mean, that's that was ownership of a, it's not a right of way, it's a ownership of, a, a, of that strip to come in to get the access to that back land. It's how a house was accessed for decades. All we're asking to do is to restore that and allow for him to do one house, one house on 28 acres. If you go back to why estate lots were adopted as a bylaw in this town, it was to allow for a provision so that we tied up large portion, large parcels of land for a single house lot so that we didn't have a lot more developments that occurred. Okay, here's an opportunity to have a single house on 28 acres and not have to have him go try to find some other house lot that he could buy, add to it, come in with a 40 foot right away and 15 homes or 20 homes back there one house where a house used to be on that 28 acres. That's all he's looking to do. Everybody comes out a winner here. The neighbors come out a winner. He gets a, a house placed in a nice area that's a private area back there. Really, I mean, if the outcome doesn't go in that direction, what you're really saying is, he has 28 acres with 15 foot of frontage and zoning bylaws do not allow you to do anything with that land. No, Larry. And, and you, you yourself 
have, and I myself and you have looked at land, which is inaccessible. And what you have to do is find a way to get, get at it. Right now, you know, <coughs> we're looking at this. We've, we've, we've beat this one to death. We've had outside counsel review it. Um, you know, it's, I, I think personally, it's, it's pretty clear, which is why we turned this down when it came before us about a year or so ago. No, I think um, what you turned down. I understand you what you're saying. You want to do just one house, but that's not the bylaws, and which we work under. And it's not just this one incident that we're dealing with. We're but dealing is this with a non this going forward. Is this what, a what non incident? I don't know. I mean, what you mean? What's that? If it's what do you mean? It's not just one incident. Well, this isn't just. People have come to the board with, with similar things about lots that they that they want to do something on that that isn't conforming, and it doesn't meet the town codes. And it and in some in some instances, if it's not too bad and people are up for it, we say yeah, okay. In other instances where you know the variances or the or the 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 amount of nonconformities is big and people are in up up in arms about it, we say no. Okay, this, but this one is not supported by the public. It's not supported by the public, Larry. It doesn't, Larry, I'm speaking. It's not supported by the public. We've already turned this thing down now. We've gone through outside counsel. It's my, hey, I'm one person. Uh, you know, let's hear from somebody else on the board. My interpretation is that under 5.30, and it's been this way since the start, that, that this property was abandoned, it's lost, it's, it's right. The, the right of way was to use the building that was there. Once that, the protection of that is gone, then you have to build in accordance with the existing bylaws, which again require frontage, which this lot does not have. I, I don't, uh, I, well I know for sure, and no uh, deference to Steve, but we're not Re required to go by what Steve writes in a letter as to his conclusion that this is a grandfathered lot. Uh, we don't believe that, I don't believe that it is. Uh, Attorney Delaney took the same interpretation that I did, gave backup for it and supported it. So, you know, Jerry, Anna, you know, I I'm doing all the talking. I'd like, you know, you're on the board, say something. There, one of, I guess one of the toughest words I find dealing with um, being on this board is interpretation um, because it, it gets used in so many ways. And um, one thing I will say, if you recall the last meeting, I was pretty firmly planting my feet on 5.4 that um, I felt that was the correct method of submitting um, this this application. However, I, I do as I read it now and earlier with um, Attorney Delaney's comments. I think I think that his interpretation of or otherwise does seem to be a continuation of hazards. And so um, I, I, I I guess I've backed away a little bit from the five point four because uh, or, or otherwise could also have been et cetera. And in that instance, I guess you you keep thinking of hazardous situations. <clears throat> um, but in that same paragraph on the top of page five, um, he does state the interpretation does not leave the applicant without a remedy, assuming the board agrees with him that 5.3 is not applicable. Um, and there are some other spots in here um, where he speaks of uh, 5.1, 5.3, and um, 5.4. However, if we go over to the summary, um, and in the third sentence, it talks about how the board's interpretation that counts and the applicant as well as the public is entitled to the board's interpretation. So the first task of the board is to formulate an interpretation that is logical and reasonable, taking into account the intent of Bridgewater's town meeting in an act, acting section five. A little more homework for us there by going, trying to go back that far. But 
I, one of the words I use, and I know Jennifer cringes, is that uh, the reason for the zoning board is to interpret the bylaws and then use the latitude that we have to make an informed decision and a decision that doesn't have to plant its feet in 5.3 or 5.4, but using those um, those parts of the bylaw and then interpreting interpreting what uh, making an interpretation of, of what they specifically meant is nearly impossible as we read them and and we even see this in the consultant's letter and that's where I go to does it make sense as a board does it make sense for us to look at this and say there's an opportunity here to have a, a trade-off for one we have a, a neighborhood that as a significant water issue. And if we interpret that, um, the, the, or rather use the latitude of our interpretation to say, overall, one structure moved to a different area of that property. And if you do note in the last um, footnote sentence, he says that um, in the, the Virginia case, we are dealing with a single family dwelling on 28 acres of land in a zone requiring a minimal lot size of an acre. Under the circumstances, the degree of the increase in intensity may not be <coughs> for zoning purposes. But I look at it and I just say, for me, um, as a non-legal person and someone who has to try to figure out what attorneys are writing, um, I look at something from the common sense standpoint. And as I said at the last meeting, this makes sense to me because you've got a cure for a significant issue. And frankly, I would look at it and say, I think I'd go buy a two acre parcel somewhere else rather than all the money that's going to be spent. But there's no chance that the town's going to be spending money to cure those problems. So this is a, a classic case of a, um, the town being able to develop, for lack of a better word, a partnership with a landowner to improve the neighborhood, um, allow the landowner to build a structure that works for him and his family, and for the zoning board to be able to put their stamp on it and not say that, well, we didn't do the right thing, we did, a, our, our interpretation was wrong. Um, it's somewhere between 5.3 and 5.4 now, I guess, is uh, where I see this. But overall, um, when push comes to shove, I'm always gonna come down on the side of common sense as long as there is no true violation of the bylaw. And so, although I backed off of 5.4 because I do believe that that was meant that or rather was meant to be an extension of hazards, um, I still say this is an issue where we have great latitude to be able to improve a neighborhood and make, make, make an agreement um, with a landowner that he may build his house there as long as he's willing to do what he's proposing. And this is significant engineering. Larry's right when he says that this isn't some small inexpensive project this is a significant project and um and for the neighborhood i think it's a real positive for a house no one's ever going to see unless you go way down the driveway so um i'm still in favor of it and um i think it makes a lot of sense and i think it's uh, incumbent on this board to um use some latitude in our interpretations of what the bylaws state and um, look at it from a standpoint that is, is there something positive coming out of this? And I believe it is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Anna? So just uh, briefly, I, I, I don't doubt that a 24 foot culvert is going to improve the, the property. It's going to be an improvement for the neighbors and it's going to significantly increase the value and to everyone that's surrounding it. However, I keep coming back to the law though and that, that's what governs us. We as, a, as, the, as the zoning board have to look to our bylaws. If we look at the bylaws, the interpretation as well as the um, support that we've received from attorney Delaney, I, I 
respectfully disagree with you, Jerry, um, that we have the ability to kind of go off or divert from what these bylaws say. Yes, we can interpret them, but I think as um, Brian was saying earlier, we have to set a precedent and we have to be consistent and we can't, the ends don't necessarily justify the means. Yes, this is going to be a great project and you know it is going to improve with the neighbors, but we can't ignore what our bylaws are particularly when there's going to be other cases down the pipe that we have to be consistent and we have to be able to have a rationale for as to why we did things and, and you know, and it has to be consistent throughout. I think that, um, I think it's, this property has lost its protection um, because it has been abandoned and under 5.30. Thanks, Anna. The, the other thing too, Jerry, just to kind of address some of what you said is that how do you benchmark this against when this came before the board previously and was was shot down because it didn't meet the bylaws i i was i'm not familiar with the past but uh, because i wasn't there but my understanding from the first meeting was that it was submitted in a different manner or fashion and not submitted this way I, again i don't know yeah but this but Jerry, this was the submitted. This one. I can only speak to this one. They basically wanted they wanted the to build on the on the land, and they wanted to use the fifteen foot frontage as as a road. And we're like, no, you, you can't. It doesn't do it. You, the fact that this one came in and number one stayed uh, site put a site that really wasn't applicable. To, to me, I, I don't think that sort of throws it into a different category here. It's like, oh well, this you know. This is an abandoned and under 5.4, which seems like you agreed as well, is that that was their premise for making it. And while the other guys didn't make that, they were shot down because it didn't meet the bylaws. This one made a, this application made, made a reference to a, to a bylaw section that was not applicable, but we can give it. I, I have a real hard time weighing that one out. This this application is nowhere near what the other one was. The other application, number one, the proponent didn't even know that the 15 foot was owned by the by owned by this property. He thought it was a right of way that came in 15 feet wide. Did not know that it was ownership of the land. Secondly, he was not looking to necessarily do a single lot in there. He was looking to try to do something more than that in there. So it was totally different. So his relief that he came and asked you was related to that frontage, saying, well, uh, I need relief from frontage because I don't have any frontage. Because he didn't know. Can I just make a point of order, Mr. Chairman? Um, I don't really care about the previous meeting because I wasn't there. And I, I, I just want to deal with what's in front of us and make our decisions on what's in front of us. If there's history that, um, um, you've been involved in and you want to use that in your decision making, but I don't, I don't want to get an education on what happened before. But I do want to say that um, in response to um, his comments <clears throat> is that um, if, if we're to set precedent and, and stamp our feet that, you know, into 5.3, 5.4, there's no need for us because uh, Mr. Solari can make those decisions. He looks at the, he reads the body, he understands the probably better than any of us um, because he enforces them. So, but he doesn't have the ability to make an interpretation. And he, he, his, he has to go by what's in black and white on that paper. And his only option is to advise someone go to the zoning board for relief. And that's why we're here. If we're just reinforcing what Mr. Solari does, then there's really no need for us. And that's why I say when, when, when we interpret something, we also have to, in my opinion, we have to have an open mind about everything that's in front of us. And um, if, if we're just going to go, it's 5.3, it's 5.4, that's it. I mean, look, I, I, I mean, I'm no genius with this stuff, I admit it. But I was, I was pretty firmly convinced 5.4 work. But then when I read, and I know um, um, Attorney Brennan disagrees, but when I read otherwise, and, and 
um, how Attorney Delaney interpreted that, it, it made sense to me. And but that when we're not here to be the building commissioner, we're here to take all of the information that's coming to us um, and and the advice of uh, Mr. Solari and and blend that all in and make decisions that are the best decisions for the town. And um, I don't believe a 28 acre parcel is setting precedent on anything, quite frankly, but I don't care if it's a one acre parcel. The bottom line is as a zoning board, every decision should be individual based on, and again, this is my interpretation of our job, but should be individual and, and fleshed out that way as an individual, um, uh, case and and in that part of our process has to be broadening our vision I guess for lack of a <coughs> better word because Mr. Solari doesn't have the ability to have a broader vision he's a zoning enforcement officer uh, so if 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 we just follow that same tack um, that we're zoning enforcement officers, then there's really no need for us. Our, our name is Board of Appeals, and there's a reason for that. So, again, it's my opinion, my opinion only, but I'm, I firmly believe that when we look at these things, I don't think we should be interpreting hard and fast. I don't think we, we should be interpreting every case, just like I don't want to talk about the previous case. Each case should have its merit. I don't care what went on, how it was submitted. Each case should have its merit. And then we can stand on that decision. If another one comes forward, the case has to be made again. Mr. Chairman, if I might uh, point out, it, what's very uh, unusual and unique about this case is that this lot with 15 feet of frontage is actually uh, continued in its present configuration since 1919. Uh, and there was a house on there one time, as we all know, uh, and this 15 feet it was adequate to service that house. And I'm not sure when it was built, but it, you know, it did service that lot. The lot's very unique. And I suggest that it is pre-existing non-conforming. And, and what was disqualified was the building at its present location in relation to the wetlands. And that it, if you determine that that can be relocated without any increasing any nonconformities, in fact, relieving nonconformities, then I think it's a, it's a good result for all, and I think it's within the discretion of the board to do it. Uh, you won't, I, I, I am quite certain, you won't see, as far as setting a precedent goes, many lots that are going to come before you with these circumstances. It's not a self created, uh, you know, insufficient frontage. It, it goes back to 1919 and uh, zoning probably came in in the early 50s. So it's very unique in that regard. Uh, and, and again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I would ask the board to consider if 5.3 uh, applies, then determine that we cannot rebuild that structure and, and where it lies in relation to the wetlands, but allow him to shift it to create no more non-conformities to that lot, which he won't do. <coughs> Frontage is what it is, it's not gonna change. I think it's within the board's discretion to do that. And as Mr. Chipman said, I think it, it's a very good result uh, for, for all concerned. Uh, and I think it's, it's debatable, as you know by Attorney Delaney's letter, but it's also uh, a reasonable conclusion uh, and interpretation of 5.3. He said it's within the board's discretion as to how to interpret that bylaw. And I think he, just he doesn't talk about the frontage being the, it being a non-conforming lot vis-a-vis -vis the frontage. Uh, you know that, that wasn't in his opinion, and that's why I'm looking at it as okay. He's disqualified that building. If the Bugina cannot rebuild that building in relation to the wetlands but the lot happens to be large enough where you can move it and comply. And there'd be many circumstances where the lot wouldn't be big enough to do this, and then the lot would be unbuildable because he couldn't fit a house on there and avoid further uh, uh, inconsistencies with the bylaw. But in this case, he can. So it's not like we have a 10,000 square foot lot that he couldn't rebuild the house and cure the violations of the wetland setbacks. He can cure them without creating any further violations of the bylaw. 
And I appreciate that this is a unique case and that it, you know, with, with the amount of acreage. And I'm not saying we're going to get another case like this. What I was more referring to is that it's our job is to apply the specific facts of this case to the law and how that you can come together. And it's our job to interpret the bylaws as they apply to the facts of this specific case. And, I, and I, it doesn't change my opinion. It was just the, the basis of how I arrived at my decision. Uh, does anybody else have anything further to uh, add to this? Can I say something, Chairman? Sure. So we're proposing one house, I guess, on 28 acres, as you well know. We're, I guess, tiptoeing around the subject. Two members are not in favor. One member seems like he's in favor for the, the updates. So if I were to buy a parcel, tear it down and put 15 houses in there, we wouldn't be having this conversation, correct? You are correct. Okay, so if I have, a, from Mr. Soleri says, a non, uh, a grandfathered non-conforming lot, what is, and that's on paper, and I'm not a lawyer, I, I'm not educated on this, but if I have a, a, a lot that's non-conforming in the 1900s, and we're bettering, we're bettering the neighborhood, why wouldn't it be like a home run for this, the town of Ridgewater and Manny Bajinger's new home? But like, w instead of building 15 or 20 houses, why wouldn't this be like a trade-off of everybody's a win-win? Yourself, the board that made a, an improvement, a, uh, a new home owner that's has one parcel on 28 acres, an improvement. And I understand this isn't the most popular project that's gonna be out there for the neighbors, but I've made many strides to make the neighbors happy. And in all projects, there are gonna be happy people with the project and there are gonna be people that aren't so happy. And I understand what I'm saying is one way or another, and this isn't a threat or this is anything like that, but one way or another, we're going to get one house or we're going to get 15 houses. I want to get one house, but I just think it's better interest. If we just do one house, if it's a non-conforming lot, as Mr. Solari wrote in a letter, I mean, I guess the answer is, is this a non-conforming lot? That would be the first answer from the board. Is it a non-conforming lot? It's it's grandfathered in. I'm sorry. I don't believe it is. Okay. I don't believe it's a grandfathered, buildable, non-conforming lot. I'm sure Mr. Silver or your attorney may have a different opinion, but... if uh, I would say to you that you're absolutely right if they have not... I'm not saying I'm absolutely right. That's, that's my opinion, that, it, that my interpretation and my discussions with interaction with the, uh, Attorney Delaney is that, this, that, that the 15-foot right-of-way to this was was specific towards for the use of the house when you lost that you lost that right away it became just a, a general piece of property just like anything else in this town and that in order to build on it you had to meet the codes and it doesn't meet any of the codes uh, I, I disagree with that and i think that what it shows is there was a house on it at 15 foot of frontage not right away it's 15 foot of frontage okay and it shows that there was a house on it, its use is residential, and the and the bill inspector's interpretation that was a legal residential, not conforming residential lot. That's what his interpretation was. It was a correct one. If it was a vacant piece of property, uh, my, it, would I do, it would be a hard sell for that. But the fact that it had already been used for residential and that was access to the house is a different. That's a different animal altogether. We. We, we keep bringing up frontage. The, I, the deed that I went off of to make my decision claimed it to be a right of way. I, I don't understand why we keep changing my letter to different directions. This, this hearing is supposed to be based on the letter that I put forth to the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals is to make a determination on the letter that was sent in. We seem to be going in a lot of different directions here and not concentrating on why this hearing is in place. Um, I, I just uh, what I understand about zoning and law is the letter is based on, on the decision is based on what was turned in by the 
the building inspector and reviewed by the ZBA and the ZBA is to make the determination. I don't know why we seem to be going everywhere on this. I don't believe that we are going everywhere and to refresh your memory, this is a lot. It has 15 feet of frontage and that was part of what you said in your letter. 15 foot right of way <laughs> as wrote in the deed. Not right away. No, it did not say right away. It's not a right away. It's part of the lot. The previous one that was way back when that we're not talking about may have said that, but it is not. It's part of the lot purchased in 1919. You're picking and choosing. You're picking and choosing. I gave you the deeds. I don't understand. I gave you the deeds. That was part of right. what you came to the conclusion was after you looked at the history right. of how the lot was created. Right. And, and you it said stated that, that it had a 15-foot right of way. And it, it didn't no. say it didn't have a 15-foot right of way? Then I'm going to have to go back and relook at it because I could have swore it said that. All right. If there's no additional, I think oh, we're going to beat this. Uh, Mr. Slyer, the only uh, part of your letter that I was emphasizing is I thought we were starting out the, the, the case before the board under the premise that it was a pre-existing non-conforming lot. And that the issue we, was and we're using five, the structure. Five points. And we're using, using 5.30 in the right. town's bylaws. Right. I illuminate the, the bylaw that I base my decision on. And that's the what we should be concentrating on here. Right. And not jumping everywhere well, else. No, I agree. But I'm, I'm just looking at the problem as, okay, if we have a pre-existing non-conforming lot, now the focus shifts over to that structure. What can you do with that? And if he's lost, if that's lost its grandfather status, he can't rebuild it where it is. Can't do it. And that's what I say uh, Attorney Delaney was saying. However, if he can, if he can rebuild elsewhere without increasing existing nonconformities, that's where I'm suggesting that he can do that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not picking and choosing your parts of your letter. I just, that one fact is what I thought we were bringing to the board as, a, as an agreed upon fact is what I thought. It's, it's subject to debate. But we wouldn't be increasing existing nonconformities. And I think that's an important point. Okay. Um, any additional new information? Um, I, I would just say, I guess, I know I was the one saying we needed consulting attorney. Um, but his summary doesn't necessarily say that 5.3 is applicable. Um, so it does come down to the interpretations, and I understand what um, uh, you both are saying. Um, however, um, I'm just going to say that uh, I, I, I just believe that the hard and fast is Mr. Solari's job and ours is to uh, have open mind um, in reviewing these cases and review each one individually um, on all the merits that are before us and all of the information that's before us and uh, the one thing that all of this um, has not done has changed my mind that I think the proposal before us is a positive one I think that we can I think that we can make a firm decision that what's before us is what, what no what what's before us is something that will have positive ramifications for the town uh for the neighborhood and obviously for the proponent um and there's nothing that i see here that's clear and hard and fast that says it's 5.3 it's 5.4 uh, I think that there's an awful lot of gray area in this particular case. Um, and um, the proponent's right. All he has to do is buy a house on Vernon Street and you got a neighborhood there now. And I don't think that's a positive for this town. And um, and I, I realize he did not say that as a threat, but it's certainly something that we as a board need to look at. Um, and are we acting in the best interests of those neighbors if down the road something of that nature happens? I don't think we are, but um, we're not there yet. We're here and um, I'm still in favor of the proposal before us. 
Okay. With that, I'd like to uh, make uh, see, have a motion made to close the, the uh, public comment section of the hearing. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Could I, could I have just one second because I was able to find Mr. Solari's letter and uh, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't any information that really should be within it. Uh, if I could... Uh, um, Uh, first, uh, okay. First of all, I, I just wanted to say that um, Mr. Slurry did use the word right away in his letter. Um, it was incorrect, but he did use it in that letter. But his determination, just so that the board understands what his determination was, was it is my determination that 1300 Vernon Street is a legal, non-conforming, grandfathered lot with a residential structure. So what I'm saying is, if you don't believe that the lot, that the house has protection, the interpretation was that it is a legal, non-conforming, grandfathered lot. And so I think that uh, that's the only other thing I wanted to add, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Um, can we move now to uh, close the public comment section. I don't see any anything in the chat is, or uh, Jen, I didn't see anything for yeah. questions or anything. No. no. I guess some people arrive late. Do you just want to say, if you have a question, put a hand in the chat? Yeah. Oh, I, can, there's, I think there's only a couple people. I can unmute everybody. <clears throat> So if there's anybody um, attending this meeting um, that would like to make a public comment, please uh, state your name, residents, and uh, you're free to make your comment. My name is Gerald Willett. I'm actually representing my parents at 1286 Vernon Street. They were unable to get on Zoom to uh, witness this meeting, so I am just taking notes and going to refer the information to them. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, I'd like to make a uh, request a motion to uh, close the public comment. I'd make a motion to close the uh, public portion of this meeting. The second but discussion, are you closing the public hearing or just the no, public Just the comment section. The comments, I'm comment sorry. Section. Okay. Second. Okay. All right, next I'd, um, I'd ask one of the, uh, the members to make a motion on this. If you made, did you make a motion for to close the public comment? You have to take a vote on that. Oh, well, I thought we, okay. Uh, excuse me. And you it has to be a roll call vote. vote. Yeah, right. Um, all right. A uh, motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? No, it has to be a roll call. I vote aye. I vote aye. Anna, aye. <laughs> so, aye. All right. Motion carries. Okay. And I would just remind the board that under uh, Mass General Law Chapter 48, Section 9, special permits of a three-member board have to be a unanimous vote in order to be granted. Okay. Um, again, I would ask for a motion based upon the application of the uh, applicant. I move to vote in favor of the application. We have a second. Wow, it's lonely here. All right. Um, as the uh, motion has not gotten a second, it doesn't carry. And the application is uh, not granted. All right. This being the only item on the agenda, I'd make a uh, motion to close this this public hearing on this item. Second that. I'm sorry, what was the motion? I, I request a motion to close the public hearing on this item. Okay. 
do you have a motion? No, I was, I was asked. Okay, I'll, I'll make the motion. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. It's All right. coming in and out a little. I'll make the motion to close the public hearing. I'm in favor of that motion. Right, we have to do roll call. Oh, yeah. yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Terry, Anna, aye. Myself, Brian, aye. Motion carries. Matter is uh, closed. Did you want to do minutes tonight, Mr. Chairman, or did you want? Yeah, to yeah. Um, they were they were quick and easy, so I'll yeah. make a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, Good night, Mr. Bye. Chairman and the board. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve to, the minutes of March twenty twenty. The bottom right of your computer. There you go. I, I second that motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Everybody in the affirmative, the motion carries. That being, I believe the last item on the agenda, we don't have any uh, director reports required, okay. correct, Jen? Correct, nothing, nothing to report. Other than that, we have no new applications, so it's likely your meeting on May 13th will not happen. Uh, we'll keep you posted. All right, uh, motion to adjourn then. I'll make that motion, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second that motion. All right, all in favor? I'm in favor. I'm in favor. I'm in favor. In the, uh, the meeting is adjourned. All stay safe and well. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Back in the uh, meeting room soon.